Hello, I'm Saifuddin Amos. Welcome to the Bitcoin Standard Podcast, bringing you seminars from saifuddin.com, my online learning and publishing platform, where you can be the first to read my work and take my online courses on Bitcoin and Austrian economics. Members can read the draft of my next book, The Fiat Standard, in full, and also receive chapters from my forthcoming textbook, Principles of Economics, as they are written. By joining saifuddin.com, you can also join our regular seminars, which you hear on this podcast. The Bitcoin Standard Podcast is brought to you by BitMEX Spot, the brand new spot exchange from BitMEX. You've probably heard of BitMEX, one of the oldest large Bitcoin companies who played a leading role in helping Bitcoin emerge victorious from the hard fork wars of 2017. Their derivatives trading platform has stood the test of time and set the standard for reliability and performance for Bitcoin companies. BitMEX is now bringing that reliability to its spot exchange and it is celebrating the launch of BitMEX Spot with a total of $1 million in prizes and a first prize of half a million dollars. Sign up on bitmex.com slash to begin buying Bitcoin and get a chance of winning. Coinbits. Coinbits is a great way to introduce your pre-coin or friends and family to Bitcoin. Get them set up in under a minute and help kickstart their journey by turning everyday spare change into Bitcoin. This Bitcoin-only app takes the uncertainty and fear out of Bitcoin saving by rounding up debit and credit card purchases to the nearest dollar, then using the difference to buy Bitcoin. Set it, forget it, and let the app automatically tax your high-time preference spending by saving the hardest money ever. Want to save in Bitcoin faster? Customers can multiply their roundups up to 10x or adjust their savings frequency for weekly or daily Bitcoin stacking. Coinbits is built on a sound, tried and true dollar cost averaging strategy that turns Bitcoin's volatility in your favor. Once you've gotten a private wallet set up, Coinbits encourages you to withdraw your Bitcoin to your own private wallet and embrace the Bitcoin standard way of life. Start stacking on coinbitsapp.com and save your time and energy in the soundest money ever. Hello, welcome to another episode of the Bitcoin Standard Podcast Seminar. In today's seminar, our guest is Daniel Roberts. Daniel is the co-founder and co-CEO of Iris Energy, one of the world's leading institutional grade data center companies mining Bitcoin. Dan has a depth of experience working infrastructure and energy, having previously been the second largest shareholder of Palisade Investment Partners, an infrastructure fund management business, which managed over 6 billion in direct assets across 23 businesses. Um, we're interested in uh, talking to uh, Daniel today about um, the mining industry and um, his experiences coming in uh, to the mining industry in Bitcoin, and of course the recent turmoil in the mining industry. So I'm sure there's been there'll be plenty to discuss. So Dan, thanks so much for joining us. Absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. Cheers. So uh, tell us a little bit uh, what got you into the Bitcoin rabbit hole um, in the first place. Yeah, it wasn't the smoothest. Uh, start. Um, I try to convince myself that others go through the same process, but that just makes me feel a bit better. Um, it was around 2013. Bitcoin was charging up on one of its bull runs, uh, running up towards a thousand dollars a coin, and we thought, "Wow, this is interesting." Bought a few, and uh, then a little while later, it crashed down to five hundred dollars, and we thought, "This is nonsense. Silly magic internet money." Sold it all, and. Um, you won't like hearing this, but then went into Ethereum, the pre-sale um, in 2014, you know, did really well out of that, um, played around with a few, uh, I'll be polite, altcoins. Um, and then <laughs> around 2017, the penny really dropped on Bitcoin as a monetary asset. Um, works from yourself, Nick Zabo, uh, Andreas Antonopoulos, uh, some of his uh, presentations were fantastic. I watched an old one again last night. And um, yeah, there's obviously a lot more literature out there today um, communicating what Bitcoin is, but it was around 2017 that the penny dropped for myself and my brother, Will. Okay. And uh, how did that uh, lead then to Iris? So I, I think Iris Energy is the culmination of probably three things um, that led to its creation. So the first was a discovery around this new one and zero technology, the ultimate score of value, the ultimate monetary asset. How do you get more involved um, in an asset like this? The second was my brother's background. Um, he was at one of the uh, the investment banks called Macquarie, Australia's largest investment bank in their trading division doing traditional mining, uh, lending, financing derivatives, um, gold, copper, iron ore, et cetera. And for the last year he was there, 
their team actually set up a digital asset team uh, within the bank, uh, started getting involved with the CME Futures um, back end of 2017, invested balance sheet in Bitcoin mining. And that intersection of, I guess, his traditional commodities background um, and venturing into digital asset space um, was the second aspect. And then the third one was my background is heavily renewables um, based and infrastructure development. So I started life at PwC, then moved to Macquarie also and worked across Sydney and London, developing infrastructure projects, wind, solar, uh, renewable energy. Um, and then when I moved back to Sydney and joined Palisade Investment Partners, the infrastructure fund that you mentioned earlier, uh, we also then built out a portfolio of wind and solar farms. And through that process, we learned firsthand the impact that pushing all these intermittent renewables was having on these energy networks. And the opportunity with Bitcoin mining, as we'll no doubt get onto, is to support that. So the three things were Bitcoin as this ultimate one and zero exponential asset, Two, Will's experience in traditional commodities and mining, understanding the cycles, cost of production. And three, my experience in traditional infrastructure, renewables, energy markets. Fascinating. So um, how did you then um, uh, start mining? What was the uh, strategy from uh, utilizing um, these intermittent energy sources for mining? This is the thing that really piques my curiosity. I hear a lot about it, but I... Um, if you've heard some of my earlier podcasts here, I'm quite skeptical of the practicality. So this is why I wanted to chat to you about this. Sell me on it. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, look, at the end of the day, I'm very happy to explain what we do and people will form their own view. But when we embarked on this business, what we learned was Bitcoin mining as a, an infrastructure-like play is heavily asymmetric. The cash flow yield is high. And it's asymmetric because as the price of Bitcoin goes down, high cost miners switch off, low cost institutional miners like we've become uh, get their share of the Bitcoin, lowering our cost of production. But on the flip side, as Bitcoin rallies, we've hit this inflection point where you just can't build enough real world capacity anymore to keep pace with this digital exponential asset. Back when Bitcoin was small and it went on a parabolic run, the real world could build out more chips, data centers, um, power capacity to bring online more mining supply to keep pace. Gaming with. rigs. Exactly. But like when your starting basis a couple of years ago is eight gigawatts of power, 8,000 megawatts, and the Bitcoin price is eight, ten thousand dollars $10,000, and it rallies to 50 grand, all of a sudden to try and normalize mining profits, in that environment, you need 30 gigawatts of power. The entire global data center industry is 23. You need $70 billion of capital in a sector that you know, has, has had its challenges raising capital. Then finally, if you get the power, you get the capital, you're still waiting five, six, seven years of full manufacturing production of these specialized chips in the middle of a semiconductor shortage. So this asymmetry is enormous. And I guess with our backgrounds, Will on the lending structured finance side into miners where he saw a lot go wrong. Uh, yes, things went right too. My background in infrastructure where our approach to investment was very much capital protection, downside, credit focused investment. For us, when you've got such a profitable asymmetric underlying project, the guiding philosophy since day one is don't stuff it up. Don't kick your own goal. How do you remove every attack vector possible in your business? We don't do shipping containers. We don't do hosting contracts. We don't go behind the meter. We don't rely on leases short term and run around getting power. We own, operate our own vertically integrated data center business. Now, that's a long-winded way of coming back to you, answer your question directly around the power. So how mm -hmm. does that philosophy then apply to power? Well, you want long-term sustainable access to power. And I don't mean sustainable in a green sense. I just mean you want long-term access to power. And you 24 want 7 cheap. Not necessarily. It doesn't necessarily need to be 24 7 okay, cheap. Yeah, Obviously, that's, I guess the, the contention. That's Nirvana. Yeah. But you, you can get pretty close to that and still uh, tick some really big boxes. So, mm -hmm. what we said is we want to target 100% renewables because that's what the world wants and that's where the problem is to be solved, which I can come to. 
And we also don't want to be accused of pushing up power prices for mums and dads, taking other power away from industry. And I can mount all the arguments, as no doubt you do, and, and have around why it's unfair or it's wrong that Bitcoin attracts so much criticism around its energy consumption. Um, as I said to someone yesterday, if you're so negative on Bitcoin, then you have nothing to worry about. Because if Bitcoin goes to zero, the amount of energy it will consume is zero. So if you're right, no stress. If you're wrong, then it means other people value it. And who are you to uh, have an opinion? So when yeah. it comes to intermittent renewables, what you've seen in a lot of these Western markets is the perfect storm over the last decade, where you've seen decline of manufacturing industrial loads. You've seen build out of residential rooftop solar PV, largely from government incentives, reducing net retail demand. And then finally, you've had these supply side decarbonisation policies implemented by governments largely, pushing intermittent wind and solar onto these networks in the absence of a price signal. Like even 10 years ago, when we're doing this stuff in Europe, we had no idea of the unintended consequences and the havoc that this would wreak on, on the electricity networks. But it has. The problem that we can solve is to go into these markets with a truly flexible load and mop up that excess power. And this isn't the narrative around co-locating behind a wind farm or behind a solar farm and operating 30 or 40% of the day. It's about recognising that electricity markets are a melting pot. Different demand sources, different generation loads, they all sort of come together in a market equilibrium in these deregulated markets. They set a price. The problem that needs solving is really often only at the edge of the curve. It's like 1% of the year. For most of the year, power prices are good or low, I should say. Well, not this year, but uh, generally. Not this year. Inflation, or there's, there's some broader macro. Well, inflation like and also like all of the infrastructure destruction in favor of uh, medieval technology, which we'll get to in a bit. But yeah, go on. <laughs> so basically, if you operate when the wind blows, the sun shines, um, and then just switch off when there's a weather event or a network outage or some other exogenous factor, then really by switching off one or 2% of the year, you can avoid a large part of the average power prices in these markets because the skew in the power price distribution is such that a large proportion of the average power price is informed by a relatively small number of time intervals. So you chop them out, your average price falls. And in some markets, you can operate for big chunks of the year with negative power pricing, two, two profit lines. One, you get paid to take power, and one, you get paid to monetize that into Bitcoin. I see. So essentially what you're saying is that um, because of the peculiarities of the transportation cost of energy um, and because of the fact that um, you know, for, for the vast majority of the year, you don't need anywhere near the peak demand. And then for a few days when there's a perfect storm, literally and figuratively in the sense of, you know, a storm that's blowing and... Um, everybody's turning up their heaters and um, demand is um, extremely high. At that point, you get that kind of uh, extreme high demand or conversely, it's at a time when it's very hot. And so everybody's got their air conditioning on and you need all this extreme demand. And during those times, um, yes, th this is when solar and wind and this kind of intermittent en energy sources are not helpful. But this is a, uh, essentially what you're saying is that this is, this is a pretty easy loss to take for these little periods of time. You turn off the Bitcoin miners and then uh, for all the rest of the time, you're getting very cheap energy. That's exactly right. And we saw two days ago or maybe even yesterday in Texas where mm -hmm. power prices have peaked. And it's been reported that over a thousand megawatts of Bitcoin miners have switched off in response to that. And yes, it's easy to say, look, we're doing a social good for the community. We're helping support the market. We're giving that power back to the market. And that is all true. But also fundamentally, if you look at incentives, a Bitcoin miner does not have an incentive to operate with high power prices because you can't make money. Yeah. If you're effectively buying power at $300 a megawatt hour and selling that into the Bitcoin network at $150, and you can easily switch off your computer, you switch off your computer, self-interest. Exactly. And this is, this is uh, I, I think, the thing that uh, is so fantastic about the difficulty adjustment. I think it, Bitcoin mining might just be the most competitive market in the world because 
um, there's literally a computer out there measuring the difficulty of how hard the competition is. And every time it gets easier, it just keeps making it harder. You know, the, the more computers you give it, the more electricity you feed it, it just wants more. It keeps making it harder and harder and harder. And it's it's admirable. Um, you know, obviously, I'm a big fan of the difficulty adjustment, as I, as I explained in the Bitcoin standard, because it's the way that we get hard money. It ensures that no matter how much money and infrastructure and electricity goes into mining Bitcoin, we will always have 21 million Bitcoin. It also ensures that you know, no much, no matter how much crying goes into um, <laughs> talking about Bitcoin, no matter no matter how hard people cry. There is no way that your emotions can change the supply of Bitcoin. Um, the proof of work is just not amenable to emotional manipulation. So um, the question then for me is, what what happens um, because of this enormous competition, a competitiveness of the difficulty adjustment, constantly forcing the miners mm -hmm. to effectively get more efficient? Mm -hmm. How does how does this kind of uh, uh, solar and wind infrastructure compete with um, truly cheap energy sources that are stranded? You know, where you have a um, say a water uh, source hundreds of miles away from a city with enormous amounts of energy coming out, and all you just need to do is just have a little water turbine and connect it to the miners, and you don't even need any kind of uh, serious uh, infrastructure near it because you don't need to sell the electricity through wires so compare in my mind you know i'm just thinking like an engineer here compare how much um infrastructure you need in order to build wind farms and those wind turbines are just absolutely enormous um or the solar panels just an extremely complex photovoltaic cells uh, that consume a lot of resources versus and you know these things have to be um shipped through a supply chain all over the world like it's, it's not just a small little shop somewhere in china that makes these solar panels it's a lot of small little shops all over the world that have to ship all of these little parts all over. So there, there, are, there is a lot of cost that goes into it. And um, if you compare it to a simple energy source like a water turbine or to a giant nuclear plant, which has an unusually, um, usually most nuclear plants have to have excess capacity. Um, how can both of these stay on the network? If there's a difficulty adjustment that's constantly making it harder, it's just always going to be much easier for the people that are using the uh, far cheaper forms of energy, like uh, isolated wind and turbine, flared gas and so on, versus uh, wind and uh, solar infrastructure. What do you think? All right, there's a, um, there's a little bit in that question. Um, so I think at the heart of what you're saying and I completely agree with is Bitcoin miners want the lowest cost, uh, most secure form of energy to power their operations, but particularly with hardware commoditization playing out and these chip efficiencies slowing down in terms of incremental progress. It, it very much is becoming and has become around access to power, longevity, sustainability, uh, and again, not necessarily a green sense, but longevity of and security of operations. So through that lens, we then step back and say, well, this dynamic globally, call it ESG, call it government policy, wh whatever you want to call it, has resulted in a lot of renewable penetration. Like there's been wind farms, there's been solar farms built out, and there hasn't been a price signal. We can also come to British Columbia, Canada, which is a slightly different, unique market where we're solving a different problem. But fundamentally, someone's built all these renewables. There's a lot of stranded electricity. There's an opportunity to go and mop up that stranded power. And if we talk about least cost, lowest cost power, regardless of your views on renewables, marginal cost wind and marginal cost solar is basically rock bottom of the global cost curve. You have no commodity. Particular, particularly when government subsidies have paid for the installation and everything. Exactly. And I look at our business, we're fixing problems. We're fixing yep. problems in energy markets that- Bitcoin yeah, fixes everything. <laughs> you can, we're fixing the money by securing the Bitcoin network. We're fixing energy markets as a result of all this renewables penetration and providing that flexible load demand side battery and doing it in a way that gets us that social license to operate. We want to embed ourselves in these communities, these energy mm. markets, because we believe in Bitcoin. We believe it's here for a very long time, if not indefinitely. We believe in the future profitability and 
sustainability for our shareholders in terms of shareholder value, we need to continue as a going concern. And for us, that involves getting that social license to operate and delivering as many positive externalities into these markets as we can. And by mopping up all that surplus renewables that, yes, has been overbuilt in many instances, but then giving the power back when the market needs that power. And by definition, it's less profitable or unprofitable for us to mine. What a great opportunity to get a win-win for both ourselves and the markets in which we operate. I see. I see. I see the case now, and that um, uh, governments have already spent an enormous amount of uh, money and incentives to get people to build all of this infrastructure, and um, in many cases, um, it's sitting there, uh, essentially collecting dust, um, because the problem, uh, and and this is where you, you know, I'm, I'm interested in hearing more about your experience. You said uh, that led you all into this, and that I, from the way that I see it is that. They're kind of like um, renewables are kind of like soldiers who only show up to battles that you have already won and they just show up to bask in the glory of having won the battle. But like if you actually need them in a, in a tough war, they're all missing in action. So, um, you know, at the time when, uh, you know, it's a, usually the, 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 these headlines come out always every May, every May, there's a headline about, you know, Germany or some of these, one of these renewable countries has on this day achieved um, 80% or 70% or 90% of their energy uh, um, consumption coming from renewables. And it's always sometime in May. It's always a Sunday in May. And, you know, imagine Sunday, balmy Sunday in May in um, Germany. Uh, everybody's just gone through a long, cruel German winter. And finally, the weather is nice. Everybody's out. It's a Sunday, so all the factories are off, all the businesses are off, and um, you know you have very little amount of energy. And then so they turn down significantly the capacity from the fossil fuel plants or the nuclear plants or the hydroelectric plants, the reliable sources, and they switch up the um, and and they run on uh, wind. But of course, you know that's no use in August when it's uh, boiling hot and there's no breeze and solar can't catch up. And then it's also no use in the middle of winter when uh, it's freezing cold and solar obviously is zero and uh, wind, um, you know, sometimes it blows, sometimes it doesn't, who knows, it can be cold without the wind blowing. And uh, with all of that, you end up with, um, I, th I think the, the fundamental problem, as I see it, is that you have to build reliable capacity. And when I say reliable, I mean fossil fuels or nuclear or hydroelectric that can reliably be there at any point in time to provide your maximum uh, demand. You know, imagine the worst case scenario, everybody's got their heater on and their TV on and um, everything is at its maximum. You need to have that reliable capacity built out from a reliable so source. And then um, you, because at any point in time, solar and wind can both be zero. It could be nighttime and it could be not windy. And so both could be zero. And uh, so therefore you're gonna need all that maximum capacity to come from somewhere that's not dependent on the weather, you know, that um, essentially is from the era after humans triumphed against the elements, something from the time when you know, we, we found those energy sources that um, don't care about the position of the sun and the moon. You just click a switch and the thing starts working. So um, you have to have that capacity. So if you're building a nuclear or gas or a coal plant that's going to provide that reliable maximum capacity, then effectively the, um, so the, the renewable green stuff, the solar and the wind, is superfluous. Sure, they'll reduce the capacity, they'll reduce your consumption of fuel um, to some extent because when the wind is blowing and when the sun is shining, you'll consume a little bit less fuel. But practically speaking, from listening to the experience of um, actual engineers in Britain and Germany, from what I understand, the cost of dialing up and down the uh, uh, fossil fuel generators or the nuclear generators or, the, or the, um, all of these other reliable forms of generation, the cost of dialing it up and down in order to accommodate, you know, oh, well, the wind is blowing, let's turn down the diesel, or, you know, the sun is shining, let's turn down the gas. The cost of managing increasing the load based on that rather than the schedule, the predictable general schedule with which, which they usually operate where they know, you know, there's a peak in the, at this time and there's an increase at that time. 
the cost of trying to manage it based on the weather ends up being more expensive than the reduction in the fuel. And it re- increases maintenance costs significantly, increases fuel consumption, and reduces life expectancy of the plants because you're essentially misusing them. You're, um, it's just like a bad driver who's uh, abusing their car um, because these things weren't made to run according to the wind. They're uh, post-industrial technology, not pre-industrial technology. They're made to work in any condition. You know, admirably, these power plants have performed in the Saudi desert and in the Canadian Arctic. They've given people 24-7 electricity in all the most extreme conditions. Um, But I don't think they can handle... uh, (laughs) I don't think it looks like it, you know, looking at what's happening in places like Texas and California and Britain and Germany, it doesn't look like they can handle um, having these um, renewables being stuck on the grid because of all the problems that are happening. So I'm curious about what you think of that. What are the problems that you've seen? Um. So some really good points in there and a lot of common ground. The I think first and foremost, I need to caveat everything with electricity markets are complex and there's a lot of factors that you can't account for. And it's um, you, you can be at risk of making generalizations that get, um, I guess, upset very quickly by introducing another variable from left field. So all, all through that lens, what I would say is, um, I agree, fossil fuel generators, I think, have proven themselves not to be very good, flexible sources of load. And when you introduce all this intermittent renewables and create that stress, either commercially or technically, on these gas and coal-fired power stations to try and throttle their production, it's got issues. Like I remember five years ago, uh, speaking to one of the executives in one of Australia's power companies who was speaking about how they were trying to get their coal-fired power station to operate a little bit more flexibly to accommodate all those issues that you've outlined. And apparently the coal-fired power station would physically start shaking if they tried to dial it down. Like, it's, it's bad news, right? So no disagreements there. I, I think there is another way to solve this problem, and it all comes back to Bitcoin, as, as a lot of things do, it is Bitcoin mining because you can solve the system flexibility on the demand side rather than the generation side. So flip it around. Say, right, now we've got this hodgepodge generation fleet where sometimes we've got, I'll make up numbers, 10 gigawatts of generation. Sometimes we've got 25 gigawatts of generation because who knows when these wind farms and solar farms are going to generate. I, I hear you. And then you might have, you know, eight or nine gigawatts of base demand or 13 gigawatts of base demand. The point I'm making is if you then augment that dynamic with Bitcoin mining to act as that buffer to effectively simulate the flexibility on the generation side by throttling up and down on the demand side, you you get to the same place. And not only do you get to the same place, you create a price signal in these markets to continue building out more electricity generation, continuing to expand the size of these power markets and by definition make more power available to any other person or industry that can find a use case for electricity. And as history shows, electricity consumption and human progress are very closely Align and Bitcoin is a way that can incentivize additional generation to come onto the networks and create stability and lower prices and greater security of supply for all the consumers in that market. I, I see. I see your point in that um, bringing in Bitcoin mining can help stabilize the load. But I'm curious here in um, you know if you're adding this. Let's let's take the kind of. Um, um, example of you've got a um, um, hydrocarbon plant, whatever it is, coal, gas, or a diesel, and then you've got a, a solar or wind plant, and they're both working together, and you're trying to get them to stop <laughs> destroying the, each other so that people can have 24-hour electricity like we managed to have in the 1960s uh, reliably. Um, so how, how if, if you bring in bitcoin mining into that like how many hours can you get a day on average like 
percentage wise and and is the idea from what you were saying i think the even if it might not be enough uh, theoretically from the renewables that because of the shifting loads if you're able to just monetize some of the extra energy all the time at the time when it is cheapest and available because you have all of this extra excess that you don't need either coming from the um, coal plant or the wind farm or the solar uh, farm because of demand loaned and so on because of that, you're saying that it, it's, um, it's, it, it, it will, in the long run, lead to more power generation and cheaper electricity, right? Exactly. And look, electrons are homogenous, right? Like now, once they get evacuated into the network from a generation, they're all the same. And the way a lot of these markets account for renewable energy uh, versus non-renewables is to effectively bifurcate the asset uh, that the renewable generator is producing at the point it is injected into the network, into the electron, and then a renewable certificate of a description that varies across. Um, so if you wanted to use 100% renewables in these markets, you need to procure the certificates as validation that you your underlying power source is 100% renewable. So to address your point, yes, when a Bitcoin miner comes into these markets and mops up that excess low-cost power, which by definition is cheap, by definition other people don't want, is surplus, then yes, it's underwriting a base power price to restore profitability across the board to these generators and stability in the market. Yeah, but I think, um, I, I mean, I guess the uh, worry that I have here is, Obviously, it's good that Bitcoin is encouraging more investment in electricity. And I think the really uh, powerful thing that Bitcoin is going to do in the long run is by providing such a powerful incentive for anybody who has cheap electricity um, to monetize it. It's just going to make everybody who has cheap electricity want to um, produce more of it and bring it to market. And it's going to allow the build out of energy infrastructure, I think, over time. But I, um, and I can see the point that it helps uh, reduce uh, the waste from the engaging in all these um, white elephant, uh, in many cases, uh, projects where you have a lot of extra load uh, at many times because of all of this extra build out in renewables. But I, th I present you the counterpoint that perhaps the better, uh, I mean, I'm sure Bitcoin fixes this and it's great that Bitcoin fixes this, but maybe the better way to fix this is to just not add renewables to the grid and run the grid reliably like they did for many decades where it just worked, where you had one big giant plant where you added coal or gas or fossil fuels or nuclear uh, fuels and a bunch of engineers clicked a bunch of buttons and then the entire town had 24 seven electricity all year round. And, you know, maybe there was a storm and some station would fall down once a year. But, you know, the uptime generally, you know, engineers, uh, grid engineers, they describe their uptime in terms of nines. You know, how many nines in terms of um, a nine? Ideally, they want to have a four nines, which is 99.99% uptime. And w historically, we've seen, uh, you know, industrialized societies uh, add nines. You know, they've got it to 90% and then 99% and then 99.9% and then 99.99%. And now we're seeing the nines being lost. And it's, it's absolutely astounding. It's been normalized and people think of it in terms of, oh, well, there's a climate crisis and this and this and that. But really, it's, it, it, it's technological regression. We had a more reliable grid and now the reliability of the grid is decreasing. And I think... Um, the scary thing here is that by providing governments a way to monetize, um, <laughs> making the get, grid unreliable, we're just going to get more and more, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it, it, it prolongs these uh, projects by making them more and more sustainable. So we end up with uh, more renewables. And here, of course, the difference, I guess, between you and me is um, I don't see the directive for reducing carbon emissions. I don't think the idea that uh, carbon emissions are bad has any kind of merit behind it. They're not destroying the earth. Um, carbon uh, is a natural part of the earth's atmosphere that's been there before us and will be there after us and we can't destroy it or control it. And uh, I don't think it's destroying uh, human civilization in any way. But I think if we try and uh, stop using all of these reliable uh, hydrocarbon emitting fuels, then yeah, we would destroy human civilization. Or at least, at least take it back, uh, you know, at the very least five, 600 years. Would, do you see this giving the renewable energy a new lease of life? And then um, how's this worked out given the recent uh, uh, carnage in the Bitcoin mining uh, industry? <laughs> 
Yeah, so I think first and foremost, like I'm not agreeing or disagreeing with your perspective on hydrocarbons. We don't even need to have that debate. Um, as a business, all I'm doing is identifying that there's a problem and we can solve that for whatever forces outside of my control, your control. We have got way too many renewables that have been overbuilt and the most value accretive thing for our business to do is to go and monetize that excess renewable energy. Now, whether or not those renewables should have been built in the first place, whether or not they should have been built to the extent they have, like clearly if governments had their time ago again, would they have embarked on a decarbonisation trajectory that mimicked and was identical to the one that we've gone down? Probably not. Like, look at all the consequences. In Nine's example, like, absolutely, there are issues and we're trying to solve it. But in but some... They're, they're still going down in the same path. You know, we, I mean, I think if you if you listen to the people who have been identifying these problems, you know, they've been talking about this stuff for many decades and generally they've been dismissed as cranks. You know, obviously, we're not going to get blackouts in places like Texas and California. This was to say a few decades ago. Um, but... Um, I think the problems they've identified are decades long and they're exacerbated. So we're decommissioning more and more nuclear and gas and coal and uh, diesel plants and uh, building more, uh, you know, swings and slides effectively, which is... Uh, the, I'm, the I'm, not, I'm not disagreeing. We, we are living in a world that's becoming increasingly extreme and things are being normalised and we are taking things too far. Like I think on any objective metric, you look back month by month, quarter by quarter over the last few years and you go, gee whiz, where are we going? Like this is a slippery slope in so many respects. I, I completely agree. Like it probably has gone too far in many instances but from a business perspective all we want to do is to get long-term sustainable access to power solve problems the market wants yeah. renewable energy the market wants sustainability capital markets demand it we it is in our interest to deliver that and if you look at markets like british columbia it's actually a completely different problem um they've it's 98 percent renewable majority of which is hydro electricity um and they've got too much of it uh, which is funny because it actually provides or creates this counterintuitive problem where power prices need to go up because of it. And you might scratch your head, but it's the way regulated markets work. So they're still commissioning large-scale hydro in the north of the province, Site C, that was signed off many, many years ago, has taken too long, probably run over budget, the usual. Um, but in the meantime, the pulp and paper industry has closed down. It's no longer profitable, huge amount of load has been withdrawn from the market. The issue with an oversupply that's created a result in a regulated market is someone still needs to pay the utility an amount of money to allow that utility to earn the regulated return on all the investment it's made in generation and infrastructure. It doesn't matter how many people are using it, someone has to pay them for it. So all of a sudden you get this death spiral concept where as the number of users in a market goes down, prices have to go up to deliver the same revenue line to the utility. Higher power prices knocked out more users of power, prices go up, so on and so on. So what we've done as a business is go into that market, co-locate often adjacent to old pulp and paper mills that have closed down, leverage their electrical infrastructure, rehire a number of the locals and retrain them in our industry. And most importantly, deliver BC Hydro a market price for their power and an alternative material revenue line to avoid them needing to raise power prices for the rest of the promise. And, and we look at it through this lens and go, like, what, a, what a cracking problem to solve. We get cheap renewable energy. We're rehiring people. We've got community grants programs where we work with First Nations, schools, the Red Cross, sporting clubs. We give back to the communities. And we're actually objectively doing a lot of good in that market by virtue of our operations. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think in, in the case of hydroelectric power, I think it definitely makes sense. This is clearly the one where, uh, you know, um, it's, it's like oysters in food. Everybody agrees that oysters are good. Um, you know, vegans are carnivores. Everybody will eat oysters. And I think hydroelectric power is kind of like that. Well, I mean, it's, it's an exaggeration, but you could call it renewable power, but it's also reliable power, usually. And um, it doesn't need fuel. So wherever you find that it works, it's usually like three cents per kilowatt hour. It's much cheaper than um, other forms of power. But of course, the problem is it doesn't travel very quickly. But um, 
it 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 also um, is low carbon. It's considered to be low carbon uh, because it doesn't uh, emit a lot of CO two. So I, I I imagine this this is going to be uh, something that uh, will um, play a major role. But of course, you know it's, it's it's not it's it's not a utopia because usually in many of those places these. Um, uh, power plants can create problems, you know, and creating dams and lakes can um, create environmental problems. So, you know, th th there's no free lunch with any of those things. Um, but um, how much would you say in the future do you expect your business would be dominated by hydro or wind or solar? Or uh, what do you see in terms of the trends within these three? Or do you only do those three or do you do other kinds of sources of energy? Look, at the moment, we've been 100% renewables uh, since inception. Um, the institutional market wants you to be renewable. Um, they want to see that we're progressing and getting that social licence to operate. It, it makes sense uh, for our business. And, and most importantly, it, we believe it gives us a competitive edge because excess surplus renewable energy is the most cost competitive energy there is. And if other people want to build it, if other people want to leverage government subsidies or accept below market returns for building out excess renewable capacity, we can use it. Why not use it? Support the power market, mop up that surplus power, and importantly, give the power that is expensive by definition people want back to the market in times they want it. And I think it's really worth articulating this because for many years, utilities around the world, Australia's the same, have been searching for flexibility of load you read about things like pool pump schemes where people install a start smart meter into their swimming pool pump out the back and try to get some flexible load out of that, incentivizing industrial manufacturing to ramp up and down their widget production. Uh, aluminium smelting, big power user, very hard to operate that flexibly. Bitcoin mining is micro manufacturing because if you, if you step back- It's a great way of that, putting it. It, it, it's done on such a micro level because not only have you got individual computers, so you've got thousands, tens of thousands of computers in a facility, you can then break those each computer into additional flexibility because they're running millions of algorithms. And all you do is adjust the frequency of the chips and you run less algorithms. And it's like so flexible, so micro, where you could optimize your power consumption live time and very accurately and it just provides this incredibly valuable service into these utilities and so what are your uh, thoughts on uh, you mine bitcoin only what are your thoughts on bitcoin uh, mining why is bitcoin mining different in your mind than um, uh, other digital currencies altcoins politely <laughs> um not politely. look uh, we've all had, maybe not all of us but we've had experience with it i, I think bitcoin is a proven product. It's been a finished product for a decade. It's clearly got product market fit. You know, even in a simple a message as gold 2.0, it's still 5% the market cap of gold. It's a bit like going back a decade when YouTube was sub 10% the market cap of Blockbuster. Clearly product market fit, clearly more scalable. It's just time and adoption. Um, so for us, Bitcoin is, it's, it's this paradox, right? On one hand, Bitcoin is seen as a really risky asset, but it's also the least risky asset that exists on this planet, if you understand it. And over time, I'm sure those characteristics will become more and more accepted and valued in the market. And what's happening outside of Bitcoin in terms of uh, fiat currencies and money and interest rates and all that sort of stuff is only contributing to that dynamic. I think when it comes to other digital currencies, I, I think they're still looking for product market fit. Um, clearly, there's a lot of bad, um, and that's been come to the fore in the last few weeks. But you know, personally, I only hold Bitcoin. Um, I struggle to um, see the other assets as a savings vehicle or an investment vehicle. Um, often, I don't understand the problem that they're trying to solve. I think the experimentation is good. I think ultimately as a world, we are moving in a direction where the skepticism of governments, technology companies, encroachment on privacy, censorship, et cetera. And if this is a technology that can decentralize and disintermediate those central authorities and engage, allow us to engage in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion, that is good. Um, but in terms of the investment case for other digital assets outside of Bitcoin, personally, I, I, I struggle.
And if I struggle, why would I get involved in that at a business level? Yeah, I find there's a fascinating uh, difference in that, um, you know, these uh, other digital currencies are predominantly a phenomenon that exists on exchanges. Bitcoin exists on exchanges, but it has an enormous amount of uh, um, industrial infrastructure um, that is distributed all over the world, you know, thousands of locations all over the world uh, hosting giant amounts of uh, miners hashing away every second to secure our coins. Um, and you can see why, because, well, you know, ultimately with all the other digital currencies, uh, you don't need the proof of work there because you have alternative consensus mechanisms that um, essentially uh, recreate fiat institutions. It's just, it's uh, governance through uh, political authority and through uh, not consensus, which is the case with Bitcoin. And the only way that you can arrive at consensus is through honest work, effectively. It's, it's through just expending work. So... Um, I think that's right, safety. Sorry to jump in, but I think you're right. They're they're fundamentally different asset classes. Like Bitcoin proof of work, the process of gigawatts of power layering down this blockchain in digitized concrete every 10 minutes, the immutability, you can't change the 21 million, you can't sense the transactions, you can't take anyone else's Bitcoin. Like that is the innovation that underwrote this entire space. But human nature is how do I do more? How do I launch the next Bitcoin and launch my own coin and try and solve another problem? And that's great. That's human nature, ingenuity, et cetera. But I I think that the rest of it is still looking for that product market fit. And Bitcoin is an asset you know is going to be here permanently. I'm not sure the same can be said for any other digital asset. I mean, even Ethereum, my understanding is if Amazon... AWS woke up tomorrow and wanted to shut down the network, they probably could. So that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just a very, very different proposition. And as an investor, if you want to hold assets in that space, then you should be aware of the risks and also be very aware that Bitcoin is just a fundamentally different asset to everything else in the space. Yeah, a great way of putting this is, um, as Pierre Rochard says it, and I think also Michael Saylor has a version of this, is, look, these things are claiming to be, um, you know, um, digital assets that are going to be used in uh, applications. So if you need to use those applications, you know, you'll buy those things, spend them in that application, like you go to Chuck E. Cheese and you buy the cheese, Chuck E. Mm-hmm. Cheese tokens, and your kid goes and jumps around in their thing and, uh, um, you know, gets, go, goes and uses the ride. But um, there is no investable case there. You, you don't take Chuck E. Cheese tokens and keep them home and uh, hold them on as a store of value and travel across the world carrying them and recommend them to people to hold on to over time. You don't pass them on to your children. There's no, there's no investable case there. That's the, that's the fundamental difference. And it's uh, that search for novelty, ironically, uh, you know, it's, it's good initially in getting you the attention and getting you um, this kind of idea that, oh, the next Bitcoin, but in the long run, it ends up really undermining the case for this being something that is uh, stable, uh, predictable, um, that that's going to be there, you know, something that you could, you, you could feel comfortable telling your um, uh, uncle, hey, uh, yeah, I think you could uh, count on this thing and not have the rules change tomorrow, not get rug pulled, not get uh, all of these uh, many myriad ways of uh, failure that we're seeing in this space. Exactly, because if, if you don't have a velocity sink, then it's very hard to trap value and monetary energy in an asset, right? And a Chuck E. Cheese token, if you're going in and out, what value is being left there in a residual to travel across time and space to pull from some Austrian influence? Whereas you look at, because like monetary assets, they, they accrue through the network effect and gravitate around certain objective characteristics, scarcity, durability, transferability, portability, et cetera. And if you as a holder of a token don't have confidence in those objective metrics being met relative to another asset, your incentive is going to be to park your asset and your wealth in the asset that best displays those characteristics, act as a velocity sink. That velocity sink then attracts more value and it creates that network effect. And and this is why I think it's very hard to beat Bitcoin because it's a one and zero, it's cracked at first, it's got the network effect, it's got the security to launch another one and try to compete with it. It's like, what do you achieve? Like ultimately Bitcoin's programmable. You come up with something that's like an order of magnitude better in another consensus protocol or another code update, 
you cannot replicate the history of the brand name and the UTXO set of Bitcoin. And the but neutrality. Can replicate you. It's programmable money. Yeah, exactly. It's programmable. You can make any, you can add anything um, to Bitcoin, but you can't add neutrality to anything. You can't just go and say, all right, we're going to create this coin and we're going to make this Frankenstein. And then one day we're going to have it get hit by a light, by lightning at night. And then it's just going to go and be out there free. You can't do that. Frankenstein is fiction. If you make something, you will control it. And um, we've seen, you know, the, the, the more successful a non-Bitcoin digital asset is, the more centralized it is, the more it has clearly visible and public uh, figures that uh, speak in its name and um, essentially do marketing campaigns for it. So it completely undermines the proposition of um, turning it into something that is investable. And I think this is why, I, what I find interesting is, I guess, the fact that we see so much less investment in uh, altcoin mining. In fact, we, we see very little um, uh, large-scale operations in altcoin mining. Um, I think shows that the, the nature of money there is a lot more short term. It's a lot more uh, fleeting, you know, people coming in for a month or two or six or a year or two. Um, where, so therefore, there's not a lot of conviction there in getting into the industry, um, in, in getting into mining and making long term capital investments with actual, you know, uh, real world infrastructure that you can drop on your toe. Whereas, you know, with trading with exchanges, there's always a bunch of new quick money with people playing around with their extra savings, um, looking into getting into the next thing. Yeah, no, look, it's right. And I think one of the other misunderstood things about altcoin mining versus Bitcoin mining is the fact that Bitcoin mining uses specialized equipment is a feature, not a bug. The fact that they are bricks if they're not used for Bitcoin mining is a feature not a bug because it only enhances the security of Bitcoin as a network because you're not exposed to an exogenous attack from all these other computers that can be repurposed towards causing problems on the Bitcoin network. And I won't go down the rabbit hole of explaining why 51% attacks are such a meme and, and nonsense in a, in a sense because they're not going to happen. If they happen, they don't mean much. There's very limited capacity. The economic, anyway, I'm risking going down there. But I think when, when you go down and look at the altcoins, you, you know, how, does, how does the security work if, let's say, that there's a million computers in the world, you're using 10 of them to mine an altcoin. What's the security of that network mean if a small fraction of the rest of the computers in the world can redirect and basically launch attacks on your altcoin? Like, do you really want to park your wealth in a token that is exposed to that? Doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, and ultimately, as we've seen, I think the the, the really most important um, moment in the history of altcoins was the Ethereum DAO hack because, um, and, and I think the real hack there was not the hack itself. The real hack was that it forced uh, the people behind this essentially biggest supposed competitor to Bitcoin. To take the mask off and say no you know we're yep uh, sorry let us the, the the puppets fell off the puppet strings we're gonna need to go and put back up the puppet show of decentralization um but you know don't my don't mind uh the puppeteers we're just gonna reverse this and uh, we're gonna cancel it and then we're gonna go back to being decentralized and immutable don't mind us um and i think that that's that that's really what it is ultimately it's proof of uh it's proof of individuals. It's proof of um, individuals and proof of politics as well. And I think that that's really the security risk because in the long run, that's going to, you know, one way or the other, whatever legally happens, that's either going to become a part of the securities industry or it's going to, um, you know, be clamped down upon. But it's not going to continue as this perpetual Ponzi um, forever. Well, at least I hope so. <laughs> yeah, look, I, I think... That it, to the extent people are trying to compare Ethereum to Bitcoin, that's not an unfair position. But I think once you get to the point where you accept Bitcoin is just fundamentally different to every other digital asset in so many respects, and then you look at the rest of the altcoins and the digital asset space through a fresh lens, don't be anchored to what Bitcoin is. It's separate. It's off to the side. What can these guys solve? Like undoubtedly, there's going to be some good stuff that comes out of that space, right? Like it's technology, it's innovation. Yes, there is a lot of crap. There's a lot of bad stuff. 
this rug pulling of retail, these centralised lending exchanges, like it, it has been horrendous, right? And I'm certainly not advocating for that. But I think if you can look at the technology and say, is there any harm? And yes, maybe there has been too much harm, but as long as there's not harm and people are aware of the risks that they're taking, then innovation is is essentially good and we shouldn't necessarily discourage it as long as those negative externalities aren't impacting people. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> but also, you know, calling a scam a scam is also in its own way an innovation. Um, explaining why a scam is a scam is also in its uh, own sense um, a free market activity. And, um, you know, uh, in... in, in, in um, in fiat markets, because everything is centralized, people think of regulation from the perspective of um, something that needs to be done by a central authority. And therefore, their idea of what is good to invest in is wrapped in a way around um, official legitimation. You know, if the government says this thing is investable, then we invest in it and we put our money in it. And obviously our money is gonna come back. And then if our money doesn't come back, then, you know, we get angry and go in the street and demand uh, to lynch the prime minister or whatever. And um, th there is this kind of idea that we are owed and there is authority. And it's like, essentially it's the scam of government, you know, as an anarchist, I see it as one big giant scam where people tell you we're gonna solve your problem, but in reality, they just uh, take advantage of you. So in, in, in fiat world, regulation is centralized and it's a monopoly and it's a government agency that gives people the idea of this is right or that is wrong. Um, in a free market, there won't be one agency. I think there will be a free market in regulation and a free market in reputation. And so uh, people are free to introduce whatever they want, but also f people are free to say whatever they want about others and they're free to associate with others and they're free to not associate with people who associate with um, uh, Ponzi schemes or things that are fraudulent. Therefore, making it so that um, there is a high cost to engaging in this. So I think there would be private um, equivalence to the SEC and private equivalence to mechanisms of um, regulating financial markets, which depend on individual reputation and depend on, um, you know, people needing to prove to others that they want to get their money. You know, if you, if you exist in this framework where a, a license from the SEC doesn't just allow you to take other people's money because the government says you can, it's very hard to convince people to take to give you their money so that you can invest it for them. So the only way to do it is to build a meticulous reputation and to get a kind of rating or an endorsement from the something equivalent of a rating agency, um, which in that case would be private market. So in that kind of world, I think we'd have a lot more, um, we'd have a lot more emphasis on reputation and on success rather than just regulation because with regulation, you can just lobby. And so we see this right now that, um, you know, Ethereum is pretty much getting away or um, supposedly they're trying to get away with the idea that they're just a commodity like Bitcoin, that they're just another market commodity, mm -hmm. when clearly it is a security and clearly there's a small group of people that control it. But um, they might get away with it in the case of um, government regulation because the SEC can be bought. You know, there are people that you can lobby. There are politicians you can uh, lobby. But they would not be able to get away with it in a free market, I think. In a free market, um, all self-respecting financial institutions would not want to touch anything like this because they wouldn't want to subject themselves to the reputational consequences and regulational consequences of, you know, we told people this was fine. Yeah, look, humans are pretty good at self-regulating um, over time. Um, I think all of which you've just said um, just makes the case for why we uh, are very comfortable with Bitcoin, love mining Bitcoin and uh, steer clear of the rest of it. Just the ambiguity, the greyness, it's, um, it's just not who we are, not what we want to be involved in. Uh, we're just a humble Bitcoin miner and yep, there'll be innovation, there'll be experimentation. Um, I do look on a lot of it as, as negative as recent events have shown. Um, but for us, it's just Bitcoin. It's, you know, every 10 minutes, there's going to be another block, you know, there's going to be 21 million and um, you take a lot of solace and comfort in that. Indeed. Um, Peter has a question for you. Hi, Dan. Thanks for that. That was uh, really interesting. I just wonder whether you could kind of um, make the counter argument against using Bitcoin for balancing uh, renewables, uh, because there's a lot of companies out there that are using lots of renewables and have the potential to 
utilize this technology in order to increase capacity, uh, but they're not doing it. So do you think that the, the case that, do you think they're not doing it because they just don't understand it? Or do you think there are lots of um, good reasons why a renewables com- company wouldn't actually want to make use of Bitcoin mining to try and balance their demand? So is the question around what other than Bitcoin mining could use the excess renewable energy or why don't renewable energy generators directly mine Bitcoin? It's essentially, um, if you are a energy company, why wouldn't you use Bitcoin? Is there a counter argument to, to, to using it? Is there something they should be aware of on, on the negative side? Oh, I think there's a difference between... Um, so energy companies, they don't get involved in aluminium smelting. They don't get involved in um, data centers typically. So for, for speculation around our energy company is going to start mining Bitcoin on their own balance sheet, my experience and you know, four years of conversation suggests beyond maybe a couple of isolated examples, you, you probably won't see that because it's just cross-pollinating uh, two completely different business models. Um, in, in terms of general utility attitudes towards Bitcoin, I mean, again, for that same time period, we've been speaking to utilities globally and increasingly so they're becoming more and more aware of the benefits of Bitcoin. Bitcoin's obviously becoming a lot more accepted. You never hear statements, oh, if Bitcoin goes to zero or Bitcoin and it's used for criminal purposes, like all that sort of stuff seems to have been drowned out and we've woken up in a world where the majority of people kind of accept Bitcoin at least as that neutral commodity out there. So I think they increasingly are, like the evidence is there. They're increasingly interested in Bitcoin mining because of the benefits, principally being that flexibility of new load in their market to support their generation assets can provide because there's a lot of utilities in many Western economies that have got stranded assets that due to... You know, the changing nature of energy markets, decarbonisation policies, renewables, just even other factors like current commodity price uh, inflation, the ability to have on-demand flexible load is a really valuable optionality for a lot of these utilities. So, yeah, I think you're going to see more and more uh, interest in the space from those guys. Do, do I think that they're going to start mining Bitcoin directly on mass? Probably not. And do you have a view about which regions of the world have the lowest hanging fruit when it comes to being able to utilize Bitcoin mining to do load balancing? Um, where, where in the world? So I think if you step back, you go, we want to be in Western bankable jurisdictions because we want to attract low cost institutional capital, right? And there's a there's quite an interesting graphic from the gold space that shows um cost the top five gold producing nations by cost per ounce mined and it's one set of nations and then you've got top five gold producing nations by volume and that's where australia canada us and you see like institutional money drives capital allocation and drives the markets in which these develop Um, so we will continue to focus on those markets but i think if you step back and you say where have there been market failures in western economies as a result of whatever uh, factors, it doesn't matter, external government, it doesn't matter. If there is excess energy and we can mop up that excess energy in a load profile that we can monetize profitably for our shareholders and then deliver positive externalities and a social good into that network, then tick, tick, let's have a look. I'll add in the interest of fairness and balance, um, you know, uh, if there are market failures, they are caused by government. In this podcast, we uh, recognize no other sources of market failure <laughs> as our typical <laughs> Austrians. We, basically, market failure is a name that um, socialists give to, I don't have enough money, basically. I'd like more of your money is market failure. You know, people out there are doing things that end up pleasing them rather than pleasing me. That's a market failure. I need to stop them and take their money and have them um, give me some of that. And then the market will succeed in meeting my ends. Uh, But um, I'm curious to get back to the uh, Bitcoin mining business. Uh, What are your thoughts in terms of the recent, um, you know, the recent crash in Bitcoin mining? It's taken a big toll on a lot of miners. So we've heard a lot of miners have uh, sold um, some of their coins and 
you know, who knows if we've seen the worst of it yet. I, I think most miners seem to have been pretty bullish mm -hmm. and many of them were on, um, you know, were accumulated coins on leverage essentially. And now because the price has crashed a lot, they need to liquidate significant uh, quantities. But, um, you know, as these things happen, obviously the miners that liquidate are the ones that are least efficient and the ones that stay in business are the ones that are most efficient. Um, so this this kind of culling of the herd that takes out the miners uh, that are um, mining at the highest cost. I'm wondering if you have any idea about where we stand right now. Like at what cost would you switch on your uh, mining uh, gear generally? Roughly, obviously, you know, it, it varies from uh, uh, with different hardware and different uh, other factors. But um, where do you think it is today? And um, how do you see this advancing? Do you think we're going to witness another kind of crazy bubble that makes prices, that, that makes profitability available to people mining at 10 and 12 and um, six, you know, 10, 12 cents per kilowatt hour, which was the case up until a few months ago, I guess, um, when the difficulty wasn't catching up and the price was very high. Well, maybe not a few months, um, you know, about a year ago or so. Or do you think, you know, this kind of big giant uh, crash is going to make people a little bit more conservative and so then we won't get a lot of increase and we're going to, in other words, we'll end up with uh, mining cost being um, a little less spread out next time. What do you think? So, all right, a little bit to unpack. So this is why Bitcoin mining is such a sensational business model. It comes back to the heavy cash flow generative nature of it. Um, I think it's well understood that uh, mining chips can be bought on kind of nine to 12 to 15 month paybacks. Um, so that prime phase, you're really profitable, right? Particularly in the face of hardware commoditization, longevity of that asset life. But I think the key thing is we're at this inflection point in the industry where if Bitcoin survives, which in all likelihood will, then it's likely to accrue more value. The real world can't keep pace anymore. We saw that firsthand. Look at the hash rate and its inability to keep price, pace with the price since October, November 2020. It hasn't been able to. And there's some good charts online that you can see that because you can't click your fingers and conjure up tens of gigawatts of power. Tens I'm of sorry. billions of dollars of capital. Sorry to interrupt you here. Uh, a little bit of a tangent, but this is a very important point that people don't understand when they bring up the 51% attack. They think a government can just call, you know, Walmart and say, excuse me, we'd like 51% of the Bitcoin hash rate delivered to Virginia um, by the end of next week. Uh, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> you, you can't just do that. I mean, the, these are highly competitive industries. And the engineers that work on this stuff are in high demand, the raw material that goes into it is in high demand. Everything is in high demand. And you can't just go in and buy that market. It's enormously competitive. People are constantly bidding up the price because Bitcoin is constantly growing. So um, you know, you, you, you're up against a moving target that is constantly increasing in terms of the size of this. And yeah, it's, it, it's not easy to increase the capacity very quickly. And, you know, when a government has to act, even though the government might have more resources, it has to act centrally. But when you have what the Bitcoin network is doing is, is far more decentralized. So you've got everybody in Australia, Norway, Brazil, Peru, uh, everywhere in the world, anybody who has an energy source is being motivated to think about uh, utilizing it for uh, Bitcoin mining. And you still can't bring that much energy on board quickly when the price begins to shoot up, as you were saying. Yes, but sorry, please go ahead. Sorry for the no, It's good. And the funny thing is, let's entertain a situation where all of a sudden someone can click their fingers and conjure up 10 gigawatts of power, bring forward four years of manufacturing production on these chips, find $20 billion of freshly printed capital, and bring online a controlled 51% of the new aggregated Bitcoin mining network. Now, what are you going to do? Like you can't yeah. do any, like you're going to try and double spend your own transaction. Like how's that going to play out? You're going to try and censor transactions. That's great. So let's play that out. First block, you win it. All right. Censor everyone's transactions. No one can transact. Well done. Let's say probability falls in their favor. They get find us two blocks in a row with only 51% of the hash rate. They censor those transactions. All right. Well done. Didn't get any revenue from it. 20 minutes. Three blocks. Four blocks, five blocks, let's say 99% probability plays out and they get five blocks in a row. I'm making the 99% up, but let's say 51% and 
and they roll the dice the right way and get five blocks in a row. The sixth block, the 49% is going to find, and guess what they're going to do? Wowee, what a bounty in the mempool. I'm going to take this transaction, this transaction, this transaction, and I'm going to make a fortune from including those transactions and behaving economically rationally to broadcast those transactions on the network and keep those transaction fees. So if you're sitting there and you've invested tens of billions of dollars, you're getting a block reward, but like, what, what's your point? What are you actually trying to achieve? All you've done is like just play around and not achieve anything. Yeah, it does have an element of uh, Dr. Evil, uh, cartoonish James Bond aspect to it. You know, the US government has successfully managed to 51% attack uh, Bitcoin. And then, okay, so, you know, for a few days, we're going to have late blocks. But you're just putting a giant bounty out there for the other miners to get out there and make a lot more money uh, from mining. And, you know, eventually the network is going to outgrow you and then you're just going to be left with an enormous pile of very expensive bricks unless you decide to cut your losses <laughs> and start mining honestly because that's the only way that you could make money. And I think, you know, um, uh, the, the problem with these kind of scenarios, is, yes, on a technical perspective, but also they, they vastly overestimate how um, how, how, how much governments can think about the long term and how governments can maintain these kind of uh, long term projects when, you know, the obvious easy way out for everybody and the, and the incentive compatible way for everyone is to just um, not do that and just buy Bitcoin if they understand what's going on. Yeah, so I'm not disagreeing with you, but the best part about this argument is let's assume governments are the ultimate efficiency um, in terms of capital allocation and executing on this. It still doesn't matter. Um, and what the, again, it's programmable. If this did emerge and there's unintended consequences that you and I can't anticipate, then the market can update the consensus protocol and fork around these guys anyway. So it just becomes so academic and um, a little bit silly, to be honest. So coming back to your, um, your other, and maybe one other point on that is, and you alluded to it, the incentive structure. The greatest innovation in Bitcoin, in my mind, is the game theoretic nature of the incentive structure. It's not a blockchain or a buzzword or you know, proof of work and the difficulty adjustment is absolutely central to that, but it's the way that it is game theater theoretically set up to survive and to encourage people to behave in their self-interest to join the network because they realise they can't fight it. If you can't beat them, you have to join them. And I think that's ultimately what propagates Bitcoin adoption over time because of that anti-fragile self-reinforcing. Um, yeah. I think this is uh, this was the um, you know, last week we hosted Giacomo Zucco in uh, this uh, podcast, and we were discussing um, the different threats to Bitcoin. And in one sense, uh, um, I, I, the idea that I told him is that whatever you, your other business model is, it's going to be very hard to beat bit, holding Bitcoin as a business model in the long run, most likely. In, and and in their in that case. It becomes more rational, even for people who are in charge of things like modern central banks, to spend their time and resources on acquiring more Bitcoin, because ultimately, this game is going to be scored not in the currency that they can create infinitely. You know, the people who um, brought glass beads to West Africa, um, they did not accumulate a lot of uh, glass beads. They sold the glass beads and got the things that they wanted for them and accumulated gold. So uh, ultimately, uh, if you really take Bitcoin seriously enough to want to attack it, um, you're going to realize you're probably not going to succeed and you're going to be spending time and money on attacking it. Time and money which could have been spent acquiring sats at a much cheaper, lower rate. Um, I think, uh, you know, we, we saw this, I think, with a lot of uh, government officials as they come into contact with Bitcoin. There seems to be this kind of... Um, so I, th I think it was Daniel Kravitz who called it uh, the Bitcoin's allurious uh, nature or mystique or whatever. And as soon as they come in touch with it, you know, they just switch loyalty to Bitcoin. And you know, oh, yeah, I want to stack sats. I want to get more sats because it, it, it's a winning strategy for everybody to join this. You're, you're better off with Bitcoin on your side. Fun. Absolutely. If you're, a, if you're a nation that's got energy resources and you're going to learn that Bitcoin mining is a productive use for that energy source and all of a sudden you've got another um, sales pitch from Bitcoin or something that attracts people to Bitcoin, goes, what is this asset? And then they, you know, one by one, people learn about it and go, wow, the penny drops. So like Bitcoin mining is potentially a really good marketing tool for Bitcoin in spreading awareness by virtue of that profitability. 
To come back and answer your other question around the state of the industry and power prices and hardware mm-hmm. efficiency, um, it might be worth just doing a bit of a case study. So we've always believed in diversification across different markets, geographies, et cetera, because of all the unknowns. Like, like any portfolio, don't put all your eggs in, in one basket. Um, at the moment, that's playing out extraordinarily well because uh, all of our operations today are based in British Columbia where regulated market power prices are the same price 24-7, 365 days a year, 98% renewable, unimpacted today by what's happening with gas and fuel prices elsewhere in the world. If you look at Texas, where we also have a project under development in West Texas, where there's a, an abundance of renewables and not enough transmission line capacity to export all of that power down to the load centres in the southeast, power prices have absolutely spiked. So if I put some meat on the bone and give you some numbers, last month we generated Bitcoin at a cost per Bitcoin mine of about 8,800 per coin. Now that's using 5 cents US, maybe a little bit less, 4.9 cents US a kilowatt hour power and high efficiency miners. So 30 watts per terahash, latest generation, principally Bitmain. Now, if we compare that to what's happening in Texas, where you see pool prices now around seven to eight cents a kilowatt hour, and you extrapolate that out one for one, then all of a sudden that's a 40 to 60% increase in your cost per Bitcoin mine. So let's round ours off to nine, round it, round it up a bit. If you add 40 to 60%, you're at like 13 to $14,000 a coin. Yeah? Ouch, it's not a great time to be mining there. Yes, you can switch off for a lot of the high time periods and probably claim some of that back at the expense of uptime, but fundamentally your cost of production on a baseload basis is high. Now that assumes that you've got 30 watts per terahash efficiency. And as you mentioned earlier, people have got different hardware efficiencies. If you look at other manufacturers, a lot of the new generation is high 30s to high 40s watts per terahash. Now let's use 40 um, as a, as a made up number, but hypothetical, let's say your average efficiency is 40 watts, then all of a sudden you're consuming 33% more power for every Bitcoin that you're mining. So if you're at thirteen to $14,000 on 30 watts, then at 40 watts, you're closer to the current market price. So I think you are seeing a bit of stress in the industry. And we're emerging in a really good position as a business by virtue of that low cost excess renewable energy that I've probably said 10 times on this podcast, but it does have benefits because of that predictability. Um, So it's a really interesting time, particularly when you overlay different businesses, capital structures, what debt obligations they've got. Um, It's, you know, if Bitcoin stays around here for a little while, it it will be interesting. Yeah, I can imagine. So Um, I I would say, um, I guess, you know, the way that I would make my peace with this is that Bitcoin is just a machine that's out there to uh, put the entire world on a uh, (laughs) very hard discipline uh, training program, economic training program. You know, it's like it's it's a a new headmaster that has come into a very, very uh, truant school with uh, very bad students. And this guy's gotten a reputation across the entire county for sorting out uh, problematic schools. And <laughs> Bitcoin is is about to school uh, pretty much all inefficiency because anywhere you find inefficiency, that inefficiency can be used. Um, Bitcoin can capitalize on it. So anywhere where people are um, making a crappy currency, people will escape that currency and use Bitcoin. So Bitcoin thrives on that. And anywhere where people are... Um, wasting energy where you have an enormous amount of uh, energy that's going to waste bitcoin can come and feed on that so it's it's it, it's this amazing machine where we feed it our waste and it gives us uh, a high-tech super intelligent uh, replacement for the worst institution humanity has ever devised which is central banks so it's a, it's, it's a nice trade-off you know we, we replace central banks with electricity which i think is a very 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 good uh trade-off i mean yeah look and it is a brutal market but if you get it right it's it's such a great business because if you know let's go back to our numbers of nine thousand dollars per bitcoin mine and we've articulated where that might fit in the cost curve if bitcoin so people say oh so you'll switch off when bitcoin hits nine thousand no that's not how it works 
Because if Bitcoin starts going down or stays here, let alone starts going down, you're likely to see higher cost miners capitulate and have to switch off. And the lower Bitcoin goes, the more high cost miners can't pay their power bill and going to switch off. The difficulty will adjust. We'll start receiving more Bitcoin every day because our share of the network will naturally float up. We receive a volume hedge. So all of a sudden, if half the network shuts down, our cost of production is halved by virtue of the fact that we're mining twice as many Bitcoin. So this is why I've mentioned the word asymmetric a few times because it's asymmetric on the way down if you get the cost curve positioning right, where you basically take other people's Bitcoin as they have to switch off. And it's asymmetric on the way up because the real world infrastructure task can no longer scale exponentially with this digital asset. Indeed, indeed. Um, all right, well, I guess this pretty much covers everything that I had in mind. Anybody else have any other questions? For, or Dan, do you have any other questions? Or anything else you'd like to add? Anything else you want to mention? No, look, I, I think um, we're in a world of very interesting times. There's a lot of extremes. There's a lot of change. And um, I think your ability to, to put thoughts in people's minds and challenge um, and make people think and encourage that open debate is a... Um, a really strong attribute and um yeah no well done it's um you've done a lot for the space and challenging people's thought process more broadly uh, around the world so it's uh it's always good to see your tweets and i do have a wry smile from time to time <laughs> i'm glad to hear that sir thank you very much it's been a pleasure chatting to you and i wish you all the best of luck uh, with your business uh, eating up all the world's uh, energy waste <laughs> <laughs> thanks safe dean thanks peter appreciate the time cheers have a good day bye-bye